Hey everyone, and welcome to the Marketing Monday weekly live stream. Uh, and this week we're talking about partners, influencers, and affiliates. I don't know why I put oh my, I was feeling, I guess, a little bit playful while I was making that slide. So just want to remind you kind of why we're here, what we're doing. Um, so this is Marketing Monday with the Watertown SBDC. We go live every Monday at noon Eastern Standard Time. And the general format is we talk for 15 minutes about sort of the topic of interest, and then we spend the last 30-ish minutes answering questions. So if you have questions as we're going along and you're watching this either on YouTube or Facebook, you can comment and we'll be able to see it um, and ask your question that way. Or if you have questions you want us to address in a future broadcast, you can email the Watertown SBDC with the email address on the screen. Just put marketing money in the subject line and that way we'll know that you're okay with it. We're fine if you just in your email say you want to be kept anonymous that's totally okay uh just remember you know think of us as a, a way to ask questions without having to hire a full-on marketing firm to do it so um just a little bit of of sbdc news before we get started is in a few weeks here there's going to be an online store boot camp and that boot camp uh, i will be doing that and i've done it for um, I did it last year uh, with different SBDC. So we're doing it with the um, Watertown SBDC this year. So if you are a Watertown SBDC client and you have always wanted to set up an online store and you don't, you've just never had the bandwidth to do it, or you started doing it and you kind of ran into something technical and you thought, oh, I'll come back to it. Um, think of this as your time to do it. Now it is a full weekend in November. It's not Thanksgiving weekend, but, um, and I get that giving up a full weekend is a lot of time, but the reality is setting up an online store. Well, it's not necessarily technologically difficult. Most of the time it does take time to add your products, you know, pricing descriptions and all that. And by giving the whole weekend to it, we actually have a chance of, of launching it. And, uh, the goal is to launch at the end of the weekend. So if you want to finally do this, or you know somebody who wants to finally do this, please share this link with them. Um, there's some more information on that page. There's a video from me explaining a little bit more about how it's gonna work and stuff like that. So check that out. If you need an online store and you are connected to the Watertown SBDC, which you are if you're watching right now, that uh, that's where you sign up. So back to our topic at hand today, which is all about partners, influencers, and affiliates. So all this is is different ways that you can work with somebody on growing your business in a marketing sense. So um, Erica and I are going to talk about, about this together. I'm going to present more on the sort of technical stuff that I feel like people get really hung up on when they think about, oh, I, the affiliates and, and the hiring influence. Like, I don't know how to do that. I don't know what that is. Uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about. We're going to talk about partnering with other businesses. Uh, Erica is going to bring in some good insights into that and we'll answer some questions that might come up as we talk about this. So um, first of all, I'm just going to introduce this idea of uh, an affiliate program. So an affiliate program is basically where you as the business owner give an incentive to somebody. So you give them a coupon code, you give them a special link. And what that does is if they you if the person uses that link and they get a sale, you as the business owner uh, give them commission. So um, for example, you know, a lot of we think of affiliate programs for the most part as something really big businesses do. Um, but the reality is as a small business, you can offer this too. I just want to show you kind of what happens here with maybe an affiliate program you might have heard about. So if you listen to any kind of podcast like I do, um, audible.com slash this American life. And when I type that in, what's going to happen if you look at the top of my screen is it's going to redirect to a long kind of coupon code here. Now, if you land on this page and sign up for Audible, This American Life gets a kickback. And that's how affiliate programs tend to work. And so you need to give somebody an incentive, right, for them to finally use the code or the link or whatever, right? Um, usually that's a free first month or something like that. So as the business owner, it's almost like if you offer an affiliate program, you have a commission only sales force that's working for you online and a little personal story of mine with affiliate programs. So I have an e-commerce site that's, I guess, been in operation four or five years now. And when I first started, I started with affiliates. And what I did is I said, okay, and because it was local products and I wasn't making a lot of money, I said, 
I'll tell you what, here, each of you gets a code for 10% off. You each get a unique code. So hi, affiliate friend, Cassie. Here's your code, Cassie. If someone types that in, they get 10% off. And at the end, I give you 10%. So in reality, as a business owner, it was costing me 20%. Now, what happened was the first year, I was a brand new website, right? I didn't have many links coming in. But within the first year, I had 3,000 links coming into my website. And in large part, it was because of the affiliate program. Now, I only paid Cassie 20% if she had made a sale, right? She got 10%. She got to give her friends or family 10% off. And then she got 10%. So it's a good way to kind of, you know, grow your online traffic in addition to making sales. So, um, so yeah, so when people think of affiliate programs, they think that it has to be something that's, that's difficult to set up when in reality, a lot of services like Shopify allow you to have affiliate programs as part of their package that they offer you. So if you're using some kind of e-commerce software, you know, if you're selling things online, check out and see if the program you're using has affiliate kind of functionality, they might actually have it. So to get back to affiliates, like I said, they can be built into your online shopping cart software, or they can be a third party service, uh, commission junction, share a sale. There, there's tons of them out there. And basically what they do is they say, hey, well, listen, we'll set up the technological crap of, of the affiliate and you pay us a fee to like, and we handle the admin of it. Um, and then, like I said, you have to offer something special to this person, right? Because they're not going to be promoting your website online. Um you know, they need something, they need a carrot to offer their audience to finally make the purchase. So it can either be a, per, you know, the compensation that you offer your affiliates can either be a percentage of the, the sale or a flat fee, however you want to do it, but somebody is compensated. And just to um, talk a little bit about sort of affiliate stats in case this sounds a little bit annoying, because it might, you know, because you do have to set it up. So 80% of brands, ha brands have affiliate programs. So if you have ever seen somebody on Facebook says, oh, hey, I have an extra code for HelloFresh if anybody wants it or whatever for a couple of free meals, that is an affiliate program. Um, and so a lot of brands have them. And just because you're a small business, like I said, doesn't mean that you can't have some of these things that big brands have because you can. Um, and I thought this was super interesting that uh, percentage of, of online orders in the US and Canada in 2021 that were over e-commerce, 16% of them were an affiliate order. So I know that that doesn't seem like a lot, but the reality is that like, you know, that almost one fifth of all online sales last year were driven by affiliate marketing when it seems like such this niche thing that nobody's really doing is kind of interesting. Right. And then, you know, a lot of these sales are coming from affiliate marketing versus other kinds of marketing. Uh, which I thought was interesting as well. And could it be that, like I said, this is mostly a bigger brand thing? Maybe. But also, is it something interesting enough that we can sort of start thinking about? I think so. So now the other thing that, you know, I guess the other technical thing we're talking about, because the partnerships is more of like, it could be technical or it could be just way more simple than using anything on the internet. Um, we also want to talk about influencers and I'm sure you've heard about influencers. You think it's a, you know, 20 something person trying to sell you anti-aging skin cream. At least that's what I think sometimes when I think of influencers, but the reality is influencers are big business right now. Basically influencers create content. They create content for themselves and for their audiences. But part of that is that they are approached by businesses and brands. And they, so let's say that I was a beauty influencer. Let's just pretend for a second. Let's say I'm a beauty influencer and you see that I, I talk about beauty on my Instagram page, on my Facebook page, and you're a brand who sells lipstick and you come up to me and you say, oh, hey, Nicole, we love the content you're creating. We want to pay you to create some videos about our lipstick. And so what I would do is I would say, OK, brand, thank you for approaching me. These are my rates. So for X amount of money, I will make five Instagram stories and two in-feed posts and one live video um, about your lipsticks. And you either say yes or no, right? Um, and there's, here's the thing. I think people think of influencers as like Kim Kardashian. It doesn't have to be. Influencers can be, have a small engaged audience. So basically with influencers, like I said, you're paying me to create content about your product essentially. So you're getting access to my audience because I'm creating that content and putting it on my Instagram, on my Facebook and all of that. 
And typically, like when you're hiring influencers, engagement rates above 3% are considered pretty good. Mm -hmm. And what's really interesting is, yeah, you can, I guess, approach somebody with hundreds of thousands of followers, but also there are these, these groups of people called micro influencers. And basically they have small audiences, but those audience tend, tend to have more engagement uh, than, than some of the bigger brands, which kind of makes sense, right? Like I have, I don't know, 750 people on my business Instagram account. And I feel like they're all pretty engaged. I think my engagement rate's like 11% or something. And it makes sense because I have a smaller group of people there and they tend to, I guess, like to engage with my content. As I would get bigger, um, I might have more followers, but they might engage with, with me less because, you know, I'm just less connected to them. So just a few stats about influencers in case you're interested. Um, so 75% of brands, you know, who have a, what's called a content marketing budget. So they've thought like, okay, we got to make content of some sort about our products to put online. So anybody with that kind of budget, 75% are using some of that budget on influencers in 2021. And then I thought this was interesting. For every dollar spent on influencer marketing, the average business got $5.20 back. Um, and then I put the engagement rate of micro influencers versus uh, mega influencers in here. And we see that the micro influencers are closer to 4% and the mega influencers are, you know, closer to 1%. So, and that makes sense, you know, sort of anecdotally, right? So the idea with, you know, influencers or, uh, affiliates, um, they kind of have two things in common, which is why I put them together for this particular stream. One is that in both cases, you're asking them to make editorial content for you. You're asking them to talk about your business in some way, right? You're either saying, Hey, I'll give you a coupon code. If you, uh, and 10% off to your customers, if you promote my business on your social media and stuff, or you're saying, Hey, I'm going to pay you to create some content for me. But while you can ask for some things, you can ask, hey, I really wish you would mention this particular product feature, or I'd really like it if you would use this hashtag. You can ask them for a couple of things like that, but you cannot completely control exactly what they're going to write. If you, they post a picture, you can't ask them to retake it. You can't ask them to rewrite their captions. Like You need to give them editorial freedom or else they're going to be a little bit annoyed to work with you because you're accessing in a lot of cases, they're talking to their own audience, which they understand better than you do. But are you allowed to say, please don't swear and use this hashtag? Absolutely. Are you allowed to make them submit things to you before they post them? Eh, that's kind of frowned up upon and I would understand why. The other thing that both of these cases have in co common is that there's a financial incentive for them to do stuff. I mean, as much as I love talking about products for free without making any money in all of my time. Um, we have to understand that it takes time, right? To create a video, to lay out photos, to think about messaging. And this person is doing that on your behalf in front of their audience. So, you know, we need to give them, you know, some kind of incentive for them to do that, whether they're a commission only salesperson as in an affiliate sense, or whether you're paying them outright to create content. And I'm going to bring um, Erica into this uh, this discussion because I really want her perspective in particular about some of this stuff. And then she's going to talk a little bit more about the partnership side of things. Oh, Erica, you're muted, I think, on your end. Sorry about that. Um, hey, everybody. Uh, good to be here with everybody on a Monday. Um, so... So yeah, so everything you're talking about is uh, is is super interesting um, and I think really helpful for people. I, I you know I think about affiliate programs and doing all of that online, and even I get I get you know sort of intimidated. But it sounds like this day and age, you know, that was the Shopify's of the world and everything that um, it's not that it's not that hard to accomplish, um, especially online um, and that kind of thing. So, so I would definitely encourage people for sure uh, to work on an affiliate program. Um, another thing that I, I do in my professional world is uh, I'm a franchise uh, special a placement specialist, a consultant. And um, we have referral partners, you know, that we work with and worked with for years. Um, one of them being small business development centers. Um, and they're really referral partners. They're not taking money from us like a, an affiliate program or a commission plan. Um, but the fact of the matter is that they're a referral partner. And that's, I want to talk a little bit today, just sort of on a broader level, as far as strategic partnerships, um, <clears throat> you know, that, that, 
it makes sense for the small business development centers to, to sometimes bring or, or let us know when one of their clients might be interested in a franchise business. Now, you know, franchising or becoming a franchisee isn't for everybody, but for some people it can make a lot of sense. So the way I see that referral partner or that strategic partnership is that we, I and my consulting services are really just offering up a resource to the small business development center um, if and when it's needed, right? And to be able to help them identify if and when a client might be helped by the information and help I can provide. So just just a very, you know, some broad examples of strategic partnerships. Um, again, you know, uh, like Nicole was saying about, about influencers, right? That's a strategic partnership. Um, you know, I can say in my, my previous life as a bookstore coffee house owner, um, I developed a lot of strategic partnerships uh, out in the community, right? So we would do espresso catering for weddings. So my strategic partners were, were the wedding venues, whether it was the country club or some of the other local wedding venues. Um, and to, to really, to create that relationship and that partnership with them to, to do off-site you know, revenue building sales was super important to my otherwise retail. Another example of that would have been, um, you know, uh, their author series, right? And so the the people running the nonprofit organization that brings in authors to the Syracuse area, right? Having to deal with book sales was just another thing they would have to do. So I we brought value into um, selling the books at those at those uh, events. And um, we would give them, you know, donate a percentage of the book sales to to the organization that was putting on the author series. So really some really solid strategic partnerships that I'm telling you, you know, really, you know, kind of especially because we were so seasonal really helped, um, you know, with different kinds of revenue streams that we wouldn't have otherwise had without those partnerships for sure. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit more about some of the other you know, things on our bulleted list here today, some more specifics, um, you know, in my bookstore coffee house. And, you know, right now we're we talk so much about online and of course, everybody, we all need to be online. Um, but if you're a retailer or a restaurant, um, anybody who, you know, has a brick and mortar store has the ability to do some things that are not online, right? Sort of the more traditional marketing and part of your marketing, your whole marketing strategy, some of these things can still be really helpful, especially um, like during the holiday season and that kind of thing coming up. You know, promotional marketing material swaps. Um, my bookstore coffee house is a little bit off, off the beaten path um, in Skinny Atlas. And so I made sure, especially in the beginning, that other retailers, other stores, the restaurants, you know, had our uh, rack cards, you know, our little brochures or a postcard with some kind of offering on it, you know, discount if somebody came in, um, you know, and, and they were, you know, willing to put those in their stores where they were a little bit more on the, you know, the main street and that kind of thing. That was super helpful to us. And and the, the swap of that is just that I was always willing to take on their promotional, you know, uh, materials too, to display them in the store where people could see them. Um, so that they also had that that opportunity for um, with my customers too, and you know the, the giveaways. I think you know during the holidays, and this was sort of a, a chamber thing too. But we would often the stores would get together, and so if somebody came in um, to my store and maybe spent fifty dollars, I would be able to hand them a coupon to the the restaurant uh, to go have a free glass of wine, something like that. Um, very very community based local business um, collaborations, right? Um, email collaboration. This is interesting. Uh, we're, I wanted to reference an article that I found just generally about, you know, sort of a, they call it a complete guide to collaboration or collaborative opportunities um, that we're sharing here. Really good article. Some of their samples or examples that they, that they give are a little bit more big, big, you know, company, corporate, um, and that kind of thing. But they have they, they kind of run through all of this and it's some really helpful information with some great examples of how businesses, um, you know, are, are collaborating. And I think even if they are, you know, one example is Dorito and Taco Bell, right? Even if they are big corporate corporations who are really doing co-branding, I still think they can, you know, kind of spark some ideas in us about who we really want to collaborate with, right? Um, <clears throat> but as far as email collaboration is concerned, 
the article mentioned, um, you know, sharing email lists. And honestly, I don't, Nicole, I don't know how you feel about it, but that is a little questionable for me. I think you have to be, you do that. I, I agree. Have, <laughs> I was kind of surprised that they, that they mentioned that, but I think again, um, it, sometimes it, that's a possibility, but I think one of the better ways to collaborate with email, and when we're talking about email, we're talking about typical email campaigns, you know, uh, you and, and another business using constant contact for your e-newsletter and that kind of thing is to be able to share content um, right uh, through their newsletter so that you are agreeing to share if they have an upcoming event um, or if you have an upcoming event. That's kind of what I think of as, as good email collaboration uh, practices. And uh, we did that quite a bit too, um, you know, and I think it's a great uh, low cost opportunity to, to collaborate with other businesses um, for sure. Um, local event collaboration, I kind of mentioned that already, um, you know, but as far as far as like in the holiday season, if, I, if we are sharing coupons and handing out coupons to people to go to another establishment, right, um, you know, but, but that also could be creating local events with other businesses for sure, right, even like a little mini pop-up festival or, or those kinds of things, and, you know, some of that can be can be um, pretty labor intensive, but if you do have the help of your chamber or a merchant association or something like that, um, those those kinds of events can be so huge as far as being able to pr promote your business and increase awareness in your community. Um, so we talked we've talked quite a bit about online. Or Nicole did, and we're going to talk a little bit more about it. I think too, as far as you know, sharing online content with others, um, that influencer piece that's so important online now. You know, another thing is those recommendations, whether we do it personally or for our businesses. I just I literally I just was talking to somebody who's done a bunch of graphic design work um, for me over the years, and she just asked me for a LinkedIn re recommendation yesterday, and then she will also provide me a recommendation, right? So so it doesn't not necessarily have to just be a personal, but it can also be very related to your business as far as asking and receiving recommendations from other people and other business owners. Um, partnership over advertising, I think the article I just mentioned covers a lot of this, um, you know, because there are there are different aspects of collaborative marketing, right? Um, partnership advertising is, is what is exactly what it sounds like. You're actually, you know, going into paying for advertising together. So the advertising um, costs less, right? Um, and a lot of times that can be a great way, great way to, uh, to do things if, if the collaboration really makes sense for your product or service, for sure. And lastly, I'll just mention bartering. Did a whole heck of a lot of this in my bookstore coffee house. Um, we roasted all our own coffee. So we were supplying coffee to local restaurants. Um, and uh, that was a huge, you know, situation where um, it, one of them was a, a bakery. So we would bring in their baked goods and they would bring in our coffee and we would make sure that, you know, we were promoting our businesses within our businesses so that people could see that it was coming from Creek. you know, the coffee was coming from Creekside, the baked goods were coming from patisserie. And then as far as invoicing, we were truly bartering that way um, versus cash out. Um, so, so that some of those partnerships were, were very, also very important to, to my business. So, and um, Nicole, I'll just say one other thing here quickly, you know, we were talking on today just as far as um the strategy behind all of this you know because just like just like marketing in general um and and it's so important to identify your target audience i think it's also super important to spend the time to figure out your real you know the the your targeted collaborations um because number one like i said it can be overwhelming um but you really do want to be partnering with the right businesses and the right people who are going to promote your business and vice versa um, in a way that's that's most efficient, um, you know, and, and, and most successful. So, and I was thinking of an event that just happened this last weekend here in Canton. Um, they did a flannel fest. Um, so eight businesses on Main Street got together. And if you were wearing flannel, you got a discount or something like that. And they all had stickers. And if you went into another store, like if you made a purchase, you got a sticker. And so um, it was just this fun thing. They, you don't have to wait for the Chamber of Commerce to organize something. You don't have to, if you think of something kind of fun that you want to do and you have a physical business next to other businesses, um, which maybe a lot of people watching might, might fall into that camp. Um, they just, yeah, they self-organized it and they were, and they, so they advertised all to the Flannel Fest 
there was just a shared kind of, um, you know, there was an event page and there was a Facebook page about it. And so, and it got like lots of RSVPs and stuff. And it's because rather than each individual business having to make their own Facebook event, they made one ev event one and then they all shared it so that more people could see it. So yeah, to I, me, that I think you're, yeah, I think you're so right. It doesn't have to be what we think of as a festival as far as tents everywhere and food everywhere and everything, right? It can just be you know, giving people reason, you know, than just your store to come to your come to your town and shop, you know, locally for, you know, for instance, for the holidays and that kind of thing. It doesn't, it has to be a fun little thing. It doesn't have to be a huge thing. I think that's a great point. Yeah. 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 And, and, you know, the thing is, and the only reason I brought up the online stuff, and I'm not one of those people who thinks everything should be online. I know that oh, yeah. I seem, I seem that way because of my uh, enthusiasm about the internet, but I just want to make it really clear to people that you can, like, let me just actually, I'll just share my screen very, very briefly here. Um, I just looked up, how do I set up an affiliate program on Squarespace? And this, there's an exact walkthrough of exactly how to do it, exactly what to click on, everything like that. So, so easy can, now, yeah. I can guarantee that whatever software you're using web-wise probably has the ability to do this if you, if you, you know, have a website already. And if you don't, that's okay. Um, you know, there's other ways to, like I said, the influencer route might be good. So um, I'm going to, let's see. Um, I, I think we have a couple of questions here, Erica. So I'm going to throw them on the screen unless you have anything else you want to, you want to add to our sort of info no. part of this. Um, Not okay. Anyway. All right. So, um, and you know, so what's a typical affiliate commission is something. So someone's like, okay, I get it. I, I should set up something like this. Like what's a typical commission. And I don't know, Erica, if you've either done affiliates as somebody who like, like is a, a participator in affiliates or if you offer them as your business, but, um, you know, I can share, I can share one example, but, awesome. I, but I haven't done a lot of affiliate. Con yeah. Commit. So, um, I, I mentioned the, uh, financial consultant, or sorry, the franchise consulting. I don't know why I can't get that right today. What is my title? <laughs> um, anyway, so so we, so this is, a, this is an example, and I think you're going to touch on this a little bit as far as, you know, an affiliate doesn't have to be a big company, right, that you partner with. It can be individuals, right, who believe in what you do and that kind of thing. And, and so we do, uh, we get paid on a referral fee basis from the franchises that we work with. Um, so that's one example of it. So if we bring a client that is a good match for them and that client decides, right, to do something, then that's how that's how we get paid on a commission. Um, on the flip side of that, if somebody refers somebody to me, which actually is um, happens a lot, quite a bit, um, not an SVDC office, but if an individual does, then I, I do pay them um, I do give them a, a referral fee commission. Um, so, and I know you said, so what's a typical affiliate as far as the dollar amount, you know? Um, you know, it tends to be, um, what are we doing? So maybe like 10%? Is that high for? Well, like, you know, so Amazon offers 3%. Okay. Um, and obviously Amazon is easy because a lot of people have Amazon accounts and, you know, you know what I mean? Like, so I think sometimes the, the fee is proportional a little bit to how easy this is to do or how yeah. easy, easy it is to sell. Um, and you know, I've seen commissions be a lot higher. So for example, at, in my office, I had the, I have these stand sit desks and everybody would come in and say, Oh my God, this is great. Where did you get this? And so after I sold three desks for these people, I emailed them and I said, hey, listen, I don't mind being your showroom here, but like maybe you could throw a little bit of money my way. And they were like, OK. So then they started an affiliate program. This was just a really small company that I was working with. Um, and their whole thing was you got fifty dollars per desk. So the desks were, you know, five or six hundred bucks. So it was about 10 percent. Right. So 50 bucks is about 10 percent. And so for every and, and I think I think I made like five hundred bucks selling desks. So um and it was something that I was doing anyway, but at least I felt like I wasn't completely wasting my time by giving people a tour of how awesome this desk was. Um, and they would come into my co-working space and, and try it out. So like I said, it can either be a flat fee or a percentage. And think about it. First of all, you're only paying this fee if they make a sale, right? So keep that in mind. But it has to be a high enough percentage. You can't be like, 
oh, 10%. And then the product costs like 20 bucks. And you're like, okay, like nobody's going to bust their hump for $2. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, especially if you're, you know, asking them to, you know, promote it different ways and things like that. So um, you want it to be enough of a commission that it's interesting, but obviously you don't want to like lose a ton of money <laughs> offering this either. So you need to know what your margins are as a business and consider, like I said, whether it's a, you know, fee per sale, like I said, you know, when they sold a desk, the desk cost a certain amount of money, right? Like, you know, there was a certain amount of money being made at that time. Um, whereas a percentage might make more sense if you, I don't know, sell a lot of different products or something like that. So, um, but I've seen commissions ranging from two or 3% up into 20%, uh, depending on how high value the product is. Obviously, if it's harder to sell, you've got to offer more of a commission. There's not people, there's people walking around buying coffee every day, but there's not people walking around buying $600 desks every day. So you have to keep that in mind as well. So what you can do is start off with something and then see how it, see, see how it goes. And if nobody signs up, maybe you can increase the commission. So, so yeah, that's totally um, a way of doing it. And I don't know if you have anything else to add, Erica. The only thing I was that was in my head about it was just like, and I think you said it before, is like, what are you asking them to do? You know, not it's not just about the the volume, the dollar amount. It's what are you asking them to do as far as participating in the affiliate programs, as as related to how much you're going to pay them. You know, yeah, absolutely. You know, because you, you think about things related to your business, but if you're working with another person, you have to think of things in relation to them, which totally makes sense. So uh, I would look at your industry, see what commission other people are offering in the affiliate space. You can you can go to share a sale right now. You can go into software and see how much software companies are offering as a typical commission as a place to start from. Obviously look at your own numbers. And uh, yeah, like Erica says, do the sort of, do the test of like, okay, how much work am I asking them to do? How hard is this thing to sell? And, uh, and you know, pay them accordingly. And then another question we get a lot is, Okay. How do I find influencers to work with? How much do they charge? Just like in general, it's like, uh, I don't even know where to start with influencers. <laughs> Erica, have you ever hired an influencer? <laughs> you know, I haven't. I haven't. Although, you know, um, again, I think it so comes down to thinking strategically about it. Right. Um, you know, and I, I also think, you know, having a really good understanding of what what an influencer is like you've talked about you know and and understanding what they can and can't do for you um and, and what their involvement is and what your involvement is is super important um and i don't i don't know so i don't know how much they charge you know the influencers that i work with like the small business development centers you know like i said that is not a monetary exchange at all so yeah so you know one way to think about it is first of all, you're hiring this person to do something and they probably have a going rate. So think about, you know, you're going to ask them what their pricing is, you know? Um, and I find the best way to find people is to actually be on the platform, you know? So let's say you're thinking about hiring someone to do some Instagram promotions as an influencer or someone who's on TikTok and, you know, look up some hashtags related to your, you know, whether it's the kind of business you're in or your physical location and see who's, posting about it, see how many followers they have, see how many comments they're getting on their posts or videos or, or whatever. And it'll give you a probably a short list actually of people that you might want to work with. And then I would just approach them and say, you know, this is our company, you know, this is what we want to do, you know, promotion wise, like we have this new product or we want to promote this for the upcoming holidays. Like, you know, do you work with brands like us? And if so, you know, how do you work? How do you work? You know, what do you charge, et cetera. And, and kind of, it's sort of on them if they're doing this professionally to give you their pricing. And it's going to vary pretty widely. But I will say, you know, people on TikTok were talk, talking about charging. I was following a thread of people charging about 100 bucks a video, which to me sounds low, honestly, for the amount of work a video is, um, especially like a good video uh, that's edited and, and all that. But, um, you know, so kind of have that as sort of maybe a lower number in your mind. And clearly, if I have 10,000 followers and I have a 25% engagement rate or something, you're going to pay me a lot more than somebody with, 
you know, a thousand followers with a 10%, you know, so you're going to think of number of followers and how engaged those people are, because obviously if I have a more engaged audience in a larger audience, you're more likely to sell more of your products. So it's going to be a good collab for us. And honestly, the influencer, they want to get rehired by you. Like constantly searching for new work is exhausting. And most influencers will work on a campaign by campaign basis. Like they're not somebody, you know, you're, you're hiring them to promote this particular thing for this period of time or whatever, but they want to work with you on a recurring basis. So it's in their best interest to do a good job with you the first time so they can keep working with you. So we got to keep that in mind as well too. So, so I guess I would have those numbers in mind. Yeah. You're not going to pay someone $5 to make a video. Like, sorry, like it's, it's a fair bit of work to be a content creator, but also, you know, you're going to pay significantly more money if this person has, has a larger audience. So, um, and, and there's nothing wrong with you asking, you know, approaching a few people and picking someone you feel like, or two people you feel like work well. And obviously they're going to have different coupon codes or something. They're going to have some different thing that they're going to be promoting. And you'll be able to see on your end, like, maybe who drove traffic and who drove sales and going forward for your next campaign, you know, you might have a good, a even better idea of who to work with. So I would say having some money. Yeah. You're, you're going to pay them something um, and just being ready to pay them something um, upwards, probably of a couple hundred to a couple of thousand dollars, I would say, depending on, like I said, how big their audience is and, and all that. Yeah. And I would, I would say too, and this is kind of, kind of, the opposite of what I was saying before, as far as having this strategy, but but to have but to have some strategy moving forward with it, as far as and and strategy by strategy, I mean just thinking it, thinking it through, but also knowing it sounds to me like there's there's got to be trial and error in this, right? So, you know, you may have your influencer budget that you're talking about that's that's reasonable within your line item of your marketing strategy. But, but what are you going to do with that budget? And I imagine, you know, for some people with some products and services, it makes sense to, to have one or two influencers that cost more. But with other, for others, it might be this mix of, you know, lower cost influencers that work better for them. You know, so I think, I think going into it and also, you know, not, not being afraid to just try. I think just try something and start to kind of do the trial and error piece of it so that because you are going to need to see some of that data and analytics come in and not not get so overwhelmed by which which one's right and which, you know, um, and the best way to go. But but I do love what you said as far as um, researching what other people are doing and who, what other people in your in your market, you know, are doing and who they are hiring as their influencers too can be. Right. And thing, yeah. And the reality is if you're in a small town doing this, like you might be the first business in your town to like even think about this, right? So, and just because you're the first one that that's okay. Um, I mostly, you know, and I think it's really good what, what you're saying to, um, you know, really be open to experimentation. Cause let's face it, you tried some stuff before that didn't work. You might've tried uh, advertising in certain publications or you might've whatever, there's certain things you try that aren't going to work right away. And if there was something I could tell you as your marketing person that would work right away, I, I would obviously do that. And I would just make a ton of money. But the reality is that we have to try different things. And this is something that, that you're going to try and sort of be open to experimenting with. And I get that experimenting with money can feel a little, um, but speaking of that, if you want a more like vetted process, like if you're like, Oh, I don't want to like, I don't want to go on Instagram and follow people and message them or whatever. There are influencer agencies. So there are directories online that you can find them, but they're going to take a 40% cut or something. You know, you're going to pay, first of all, you're going to pay to access the directory. And then also they're going to take a cut of the influencers money. So there is somebody who has done that hard work of researching and categorizing people by areas of influence and pulling the data together and allowing the introduction to happen, but you are going to pay for that. So either way you're paying for it, I guess, whether you, it's going to be less expensive for you to find it on your own. Um, but maybe it's going to be a little bit more experimental to do it that way as well. So there are, like I said, there are people who do this. And if you think about anything online, I get that it's just information, but someone has to gather it together. So we do have to pay them for that, you know, like, and that's, that's part of it. So, um, so yeah. And, uh, I think this will be the final question for today, just looking at the time. But, uh, the other question we had to come in is how do I find businesses who want to partner or like who wanted, who would want to run a flannel fest with me? Who would want to 
go in on some advertising. Um, and I think you probably have some good insights on that, Erica, because I know less about that. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so my first answer is ask. <laughs> you know, don't be afraid to ask. Um, because if you, everybody else is looking for the same, you know, or, or if they're not, they should be, you know, interested in in, in strategic collaborations for sure. Um, I I think you know what community involvement is huge. If you are, if you do have a brick and mortar, um, I think that you know networking meetings, um, being part of your chamber in a contributory way, you know, um, will will help develop those relationships. Um, and again, I am thinking more along the lines of um, in a community, you know, because that's my background. But, but you know, that way there a lot of relationships are already established when all of a sudden you realize, hey, you know, this could be a great strategic partnership um, for this specific promotion or that kind of thing. So that can be that can be really helpful. Um, I know that the article that we, we popped up um, has a, email template uh, to use if you're interested in reaching out to a business or an individual about, you know, a, a partnership or a collaboration. Um, so that's, you know, one, one example you could, you could use um, to do, to make it a little bit easier, you know, but then if you're sending it out, out an email, you don't hear back, I would follow up with them just so you can talk personally about, you know, what you're thinking, what your thinking is behind it, you know, about the promotion, the, the whys, the whys about it all. So, um, but most of the time, I think people are going to find people are pretty receptive, um, just because you had the idea. <laughs> you know, it's you know you you're bringing an idea to to them that is that is beneficial to them as well. So, yeah, and not everybody is the idea person. You know, somebody has to have the idea. And if you, particularly if you've thought through how they'll fit into the idea versus being like, oh, I'm doing this. If you want to join me if you're like oh i'm doing this and i thought it would be really great if you contributed the, even if they don't want to at least you thought kind of how they would fit into this thing um hey we're thinking about going in on a big full page ad in the newspaper it costs this much if four of us put in x amount of money we can you know basically design something together about you know a holiday promotion or something like that um but think through how I think people would be involved if you're going to be the idea person. Cause sometimes people just, sometimes I think they're not interested, but it's really that they just don't know. They don't know how to, you just brought them this big idea and they're like, uh, I, I don't know. As somebody who has a lot of ideas, like I know it can be uh, overwhelming to people sometimes when I come at them with this giant idea that they can participate in. If I think through how they could participate, it goes a lot better. Um, and you yeah. know, this, it doesn't have to be like something you do forever either. It could be a limited thing. It could be a one day thing or a one time advertisement. It doesn't have to be this ongoing business partnership. Let's go set up an LLC together thing, you know? Yeah. 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 And at the same time, I was just going to mention, you know, the, the trust is important here, whether it's, you know, a small one, one off or, you know, a, a long-term partnership. But, um, and, and I think that, you know, if we're thinking about, online too. I know a lot of people use LinkedIn, right? To sort of think about those partnerships, those strategic, you know, companies or individuals who can, who might be of assistance or a good collaborative partner. And if you're on LinkedIn and, you know, in a, in a, um, a way that people can see who you are, what you do, uh, and have that sort of trust already established because you've connected or you also have mutual connections, that can be, you know, a, a great way to, to help, you know, when you're ready to do something. And I know a lot of people use LinkedIn to look up the name. Like, so if you're trying to find, oh, I'm looking for, you know, uh, the owner or the marketing person at this company, you'll use it to find their name and then go to their website or whatever and get their email. Because sometimes like trying to message someone on LinkedIn you're not connected with, you go into a different inbox or you have to pay to send them an email. But, yeah. uh, but it is a really great directory, like, like you said, for finding these people and also showcasing kind of what you're up to. Um, and yeah, I try to post there like once a week ish mm -hmm. so that like I'm still active in people's feeds and I'm mm -hmm. showing up in the LinkedIn digest that they send out once a week. Um, yeah. Cause I've actually yeah, posting content. Is, yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Have to be a ton, sure. but but yeah, just, you know, um, 
try something out. And I know it's very tempted, especially if you're a self-starter, which you are, if you're a business owner to just, I'm just going to set this up on my own, but um, it's kind of like that, uh, that, I don't know. I meant to look up the origin of this, of this saying, but you know, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And that's kind of, so it'll take longer and it'll be more organization to involve other people. But, um, but in reality, there can just be a lot of benefits, whether, like I said, whether you're thinking about, you know, uh, influencers, what, what do we call this? Partners, influencers, or affiliates. Like, you know, it could be that one of these things we talked about today sort of speaks to you as a, as a format and just start with that, you know, and, and kind of see what people are interested in. And you might be surprised. I know with my unknown e-commerce site, I mean, I had, it was a local e-commerce site and I, I know a fair bit of people locally. And I think I started off with 15 affiliates, like right off, like the week one, I was just very surprised at how many local bloggers and, you know, social media, like active social media people and, and whatever who are interested in participating in the program. And because nobody else in my area was doing it, I think it was um, pretty attractive for, for most people. And like I said, yeah, it drove a few, some sales, not infinite sales, but it drove some, but it built a lot of links coming into my website, especially that first year when we were really trying to get further out into the internet um, so that we're, you know, more findable online generally. So, um, so yeah, I think that's just about it. Unless Erica, you've got anything else to add before we close out the broadcast here. Um, I don't think so. All right. So we're just going to throw this on the screen here. Um, if you are watching this and you are inspired to contact, uh, the Watertown SBDC, you know, finally get in to get, go see that, you know, that counselor that can help you out maybe with one of these things or something else entirely. The contact info is on the screen. Um, the services are free. There's, there's, I think at least four counselors that I know of at the Watertown SBDC who are doing really great work and, um, you know, just set up an appointment. And, uh, you know, just as a final, you know, iteration too, we've got this, you know, cool thing coming up, this online store boot camp. So if you do not have an online store, you have no idea where to start and you just want to do it. It's a whole weekend and we're going to build the online store. It's hundred percent online. So you can still wear your soft pants, very into the soft pants these days. I'm sure you are too. Um, and we are going to build the online store together and yes, it will take uh, some time. And yes, I get you're giving up a weekend in November, but you will have an online store to sell things on for the upcoming holiday season. So I think it is worthwhile. So go to that link. You'll learn more if you're interested in that sort of thing. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Share this episode with someone you think might get a kick out of it. You know, you can tag them in the comments or just send it to them with the share button. And uh, we appreciate this. We go live, like I said, every Monday. So join us next week. Uh, for another marketing related topic. And don't forget to send us your questions. Thanks so much. Have a great day. Bye, everyone.